Civil Liberties. So this is one of my two favorite chapters to teach. Uh, the next one obviously being Civil Rights. Um, <clears throat> civil Liberties and Civil Rights are very different from one another. Uh, people tend to kind of use the terms interchangeably to refer to the same thing, but that's not correct. Uh, civil liberties are the, the liberties, the freedoms given to us by the Bill of Rights, those 10 amendments to the Constitution. Civil rights tends uh, to do more with arbitrary discrimination based on uh, identity issues. And so we'll talk about civil liberties first, and then our next chapter will be on civil rights. So, <clears throat> when the founders were writing the Constitution at the convention in 1789, uh, there was this argument over including a Bill of Rights. Um, Hamilton and the Federalists, the ones who were in favor of uh, federal government authority, uh, believed that it was unnecessary, that the Constitution uh, restricted certain powers to Congress, to the president, to the court system, and that essentially uh, the whole Constitution uh, was a Bill of Rights. And they cited habeas corpus. Uh, Article 1, Section 9, uh, habeas corpus prevented the government from depriving liberty without a trial in court. Uh, habeas corpus, if you don't know, is a Latin term that essentially means show me the body which if you are accused of a crime, there has to be evidence against you uh, for you to be arrested and held for that crime. If there's no evidence that you committed a crime, there should be no reason why you are arrested. And so that's what habeas corpus is. And this is what the Federalists believe protected citizens from their rights being abused. Um, it also prohibited uh, a bill of attainder, which could declare someone guilty without a trial, or the enforcement of ex post facto laws, which were essentially uh, laws that were passed to make something illegal. Uh, you could not be arrested or tried for engaging in that activity before that law was passed. And so the Federalists believed that all of these things together were enough protections that a Bill of Rights were not needed. The Anti-Federalists, the state's rights people, uh, led by Thomas Jefferson, believed that if the Bill of Rights was not included in the Constitution, that the document would be imperfect, and the Anti-Federalists refused to ratify the Constitution until one was included. And so, obviously, the Anti-Federalists win, and we get the Bill of Rights. And this establishes our civil liberties, uh, our areas of personal freedom protected from government interference. And we pretty much see these ten amendments as, you know, they are kind of the foundation of our country. These rights cannot be denied to anyone uh, you know, we hold these almost as gospel in our country, the, the, the Bill of Rights. And <clears throat> later on, the 14th Amendment would be passed um, that would essentially say that the Bill of Rights was, all citizens were entitled to the protections of the Bill of Rights, no matter what state they lived in. Some states believed that this essentially only applied to federal government and not to the states, but the 14th Amendment is passed to clarify that. Uh, and the 14th Amendment uh, says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. So that expands it to all states and the states cannot deny uh, you know, civil liberties to its citizens. Um, and then if you have the book, there's some, uh, trials, uh, cases that you can look at dealing with the 14th amendment in the States, but you don't have to, I'm not going to ask you anything about that. All right. We'll start with the big one. First amendment, first amendment. Um, you know, this one, we still argue over the first amendment. Um, the first amendment is probably, the most important and the most complicated because it deals with so many issues in one amendment. Uh, the first being religion. So the First Amendment has two clauses in it about religion. The Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. 
The Establishment Clause says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. So what do we mean by that? It means that Congress cannot declare one religion the official religion of the United States or force citizens to practice a particular religion. Uh, the Free Exercise Clause, down here at the bottom, uh, protects citizens' right to practice any religion. So uh, no matter how crazy a belief system may be, looking at you, Scientology, uh, if it's recognized as a religion, citizens have the right to practice it. They can apply for the protections of a religious organization, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> so now this is where this idea of what does the separation of church and state mean? The, the separation of church and state is not, that, that phrase is not used in the First Amendment. It was an idea that Jefferson came up with, and he had written about extensively in other papers, but it was not written exclusively in the First Amendment. We use these two clauses to essentially establish the separation of church and state. And so... The, the issue of religion and government has come up so many times throughout our history, and the Supreme Court comes up with kind of a checklist to see if religion and government being intertwined is permissible. And they call this the Lemon Test, and it comes from the case Lemon versus Kurtzman, uh, sorry, Kurtzman, that was over the idea of using taxpayer money to fund religious schools. So there's three... Uh, points here are three uh, criteria that something has to meet uh, for it to be constitutional. One, is the purpose secular? So is the purpose not religious? So if we look at funding religious schools, um, is its purpose secular? You can make an argument that it is because it is for education. Now, the problem is that most religious schools also include religious education, a requirement to go to chapel or, you know, uh, engage in religious activity. So if that's the case, then it is not secular. But if the school is just getting funding for education, then it could make the uh, argument that the money is only being used for secular activities. Uh, two, Purpose neither to advance or inhibit religion. So if we're looking at religious schools, if they're requiring students to attend religious education classes, attend chapel and things like that, then they are trying to advance the religion and that would make it unconstitutional. But federal money cannot be used to inhibit religion either. So that's a big uh, kind of caveat on the end where other groups that are not religious cannot use federal money to try and inhibit religion. Uh, and then three, did not entangle the government with religious institutions. This is the one that most organizations cannot meet. Uh, if you give federal funding to a religious school, it entangles the government with religious education. And that hurdle is probably the biggest hurdle. So uh, now an example of where... Uh, federal funding can be received by institutions and passes that third criteria is student religious groups at universities. They can receive funding just like all other student groups um, because they are student led. They are not led by faculty or an employee of the institution and therefore it is not the institution that is, uh, you know, engaging in religious activity, but the students themselves. And for fairness, those groups cannot be excluded from funding because then, like number two says, we would be inhibiting religion. Uh, also, the under God left in the Pledge of Allegiance, which has come up, you know, numerous times in our history, uh, in our history, at least since the 1950s, when it was added, um, you know, th this idea that this should be taken out of the uh, the pledge, that uh, in God we trust should be taken off our money. It's been allowed to stand out of tradition more than anything else that uh, students, when they say the, the Pledge of Allegiance, are not compelled to say under God. Uh, you're not compelled to believe in God, even though it's on the money. So that's kind of the argument that the court has come up with for that. Um, now, if we're looking at 
schools, uh, you know, like uh, with public schools and things like that. Are, is prayer allowed in school? Is religion allowed in school? Yes, it is. But it has to be led by the students. It cannot be compelled by the school or any official of the school. So that's why on public school campuses today, almost all religious activity is led by students because that is not unconstitutional. But the minute it becomes required or compelled by an official of the school, then it violates the First Amendment. Now, the First Amendment also covers speech. This is the full First Amendment here on the right. Um, <clears throat> so, a Brit, uh, Congress shall make no law uh, abridging the freedom of speech, the freedom of the press, the right of the people to peaceably assemble, and petition the government for a redress of grievances. So that's a lot of things. Uh, we talked about religion, speech, freedom of the press, uh, the right to peaceably assemble, so protest. Uh, petition the government, uh, you know, start petitions, demand change, all that kind of stuff. Now, political speech has been complicated throughout our history. Um, immediately after writing the First Amendment, the first, uh, you know, Congress of the United States passes the Alien and Sedition Acts. And essentially what these acts do is they allowed for people to be punished for publishing or saying criticism of the government of the United States. Well, that goes completely against the idea of the First Amendment. The justification for this was that the United States was a new country um, and that it really couldn't stand up to this criticism, and so we needed to not allow it while the country kind of got on its feet and got going. The Alien and Sedition Acts were enforceable for 10 years, they were very unpopular, and they expired before they could be ruled unconstitutional, and they were not renewed, obviously. So we as citizens have the right to criticize our government, to protest our government, any of that kind of stuff, and that was a big part of what the founders wanted, because you could not do that in a monarchy. So they wanted to allow for this ability to criticize the government. Now, one, there's a couple of areas where uh, speech can be limited. Uh, one is the clear and present danger test. If speech is protected or unprotected based on its capacity to present a danger to society. The example that's always used here is running in and yelling fire in a crowded room. Um, this falls under the Brandenburg versus Ohio ruling. Um, if speech incites violence, it cannot be prohibited, even if it's unpopular or racist. Uh, I'm sorry, unless speech incites violence. It cannot be prohibited, even if it's unpopular or racist. This is a difficult thing to deal with, because there, uh, when we're talking about hate speech, which we'll get to in a minute, um, hate speech can incite violence. I know as... Being Latino, there are certain things that you could call me that would uh, prompt me to punch you in the face. And so there's always been this difficulty in dealing with racism and hate speech because for most of us, it can incite violence. But that's not what the court is talking about here. What they're talking about is creating a situation that, um, you know, would cause people to get harmed through no fault of their own. So something like running into a theater and yelling fire, and then everyone gets up and tramples each other trying to get out. Or, you know, in a more modern example, if somebody ran into one of your classrooms <coughs> and said that there was an active shooter on campus, everyone would get up and probably lose their mind, and people could get hurt because of that. So that's the kind of thing that the Supreme Court is talking about here. We'll get to hate speech in a minute. And then one of the most unpopular decisions uh, of the modern era is the Citizens United decision, which essentially says that corporations are entitled to free speech, and they express that free speech by supporting candidates, funding election campaigns, paying for ads, and all of that kind of stuff. And then this decision was used in 2014 to remove 
spending limits on the contributions of corporations. So essentially, this ruling says that corporations have the right to free speech as well. That's not something most people are comfortable with, because when we're talking about a corporation, who are we talking about? Corporations are made up of numerous people who do not all share the same point of view. So then whose speech is being promoted by a corporation? Well, it's going to be those at the top, the CEO, the owners, the board, that kind of stuff. It's not about the frontline workers, the people at the bottom of the ladder who are making the least. And then corporations have unlimited resources. You look at a corporation like Amazon or Apple or someone like that, they can outspend the average American citizen on election spending. And therefore, it's created this situation where their speech uh, is, sorry guys, I don't know what's going on here, um, where their speech is more important than ours simply because they have more money than we do. And it, is, and it equates money to free speech, which is something most people are, are uncomfortable with. And you've seen, a, there, there have been a lot of politicians that have spoken out about this, Bernie Sanders being one of the most uh, well-known. Uh, but a lot of, uh, of people running for office want to overturn this decision because they don't like this equation of speech with money. So what do y'all think about that? Should corporations be entitled to free speech and should money equal speech as well? Um, it's a very dangerous idea, I think. All right. <clears throat> now, fighting words and hate speech. Uh, fighting words, speech that directly incites damaging conduct. So these are not protected. Uh, so let's look at some cases here. In 1942, a man at a protest called a police officer a goddamn racketeer and a damn fascist. He was arrested and the Supreme Court upheld his arrest. They stated the First Amendment provided no protection for offensive speech. Um, Dennis versus the United States, 1951. Supreme Court states that there is no substantial interest in protecting lewd, obscene, profane, libelous, or insulting fighting words. Um, these protect these protections essentially say that you know cuss words, uh, you know things like that, really offer no substance to society and therefore are not uh, protected. Libelous words, which are lies, are not protected. Uh, lewd, obscene, profane. But those are very subjective ideas. What is lewd and profane and obscene to one person is not to another. Um, I cuss. Y'all probably noticed that listening to my lectures. Um, so, you know, our concepts of what these these are are very different from person to person. Um, despite lots of activism, these protections have never been applied to racial and ethnic slurs or slurs used against people for personal characteristics. Uh, so any racial epithet is not, does not fall in this category, which then means that when it comes to hate speech, the responsibility is on the individual. It is on the person being called the worst thing they've probably ever been called to restrain themselves and not punch someone in the face. Um, now, it's it's glaringly obvious that this is not right. That, uh, but there are a lot of arguments on this issue. We'll get to we'll get back to it in a minute. But why would hate speech not fall under this category? Why is hate speech protected when other things like curse words and things like that are not? That's something that you could possibly write about there. Now, these protections do apply to sexual harassment. Um, <clears throat> sexual harassment, whether it is uh, spoken or whether it is implied or things like that, is not protected and is considered criminal. Uh, usually because sexual harassment comes with a threat of retaliation or a threat of violence. So those rise to the level of being criminal. Um, looking at, uh, you know... Some other racist speech, uh, Rav versus City of St. Paul, 1992. Court struck down city ban on burning crosses in yards 
because it only targeted one action against one group, that it was too narrow. So the city could not outlaw the burning of crosses because it was the ordinance was only written for burning crosses. To make it legal, it would have to be written in a much broader way, but there's no real other form of, of racist speech that kind of compares to it. So what else would you include? Maybe the hanging of nooses and things like that. Um, but again, this shows you how hate speech is not covered under this idea. Student speech. <clears throat> the court has ruled that the speech of high school students and students in, you know, K through 12 can be restricted, basically stating that the purpose for a student being at school is education, and education is more important than their right to say whatever they want to say. Um, in 2007, in this case, Morse versus Frederick, uh, a student in Alaska displayed a banner that said, Bong Hits for Jesus, as the Olympic torch was being uh, was coming through his town. They led all the students out of school that day, and they lined the streets to watch the Olympic torch run through the town because it's kind of one of those once-in-a-lifetime type things. And this kid decides he's going to do this because this banner will be, you know, as the torch runs by, this is going to be shown on every TV network that's there to film this. And so um, he is uh, expelled from school, punished, and all that good stuff. And the court upholds his punishment, stating that, one, he's a student, and he should have been there for education, but the counter-argument was that they let the kids out of school, so he actually wasn't in school at the time that this was done. But because his speech advocated an illegal activity, which was the use of marijuana, that it is not protected speech. So they ruled that student speech can be uh, restricted. Symbolic speech is one that people have a lot of problems with. Um, there's a few examples here that you should be familiar with, but symbolic speech is a visual that is conveying a message. Um, so, in 1939, Hague versus Committee for Industrial Organization, Court ruled that protesting, passing out pamphlets, and other activism cannot be restricted except to ensure public safety. So if you're protesting and passing out materials with images on them, uh, the only way it can be restricted is for public safety. So you can't stand in the middle of a road and do it, but you can stand on the sidewalk and do it. Or if you're in a protest, you they can set a particular path for you and close down the streets, but you have to get a permit just so they can do that. So... Those are some reasonable restrictions. Now, in 1984, um, there's a protest, uh, I believe it was in Dallas. It was in Texas for sure, but I think it was in Dallas, where um, a man was arrested for burning the American flag and fights this case all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court rules that burning the American flag is symbolic speech and cannot be restricted. This one probably upsets people the most. Um, so the flag means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And how we display the flag, there are regulations for how the flag is supposed to be displayed and respected and things like that. But <clears throat> burning the flag is seen as a form of protest of uh, people showing that they are dissatisfied with their country. And so provided that the flag belongs to you, you didn't steal it from someone else, you can burn the flag as a show of protest against your country. Now, a lot, a lot of people do not like this. They're very uncomfortable with it. But what's ironic about a lot of those people who don't like the burning of the American flag, uh, people who don't like the burning of the flag tend to be more conservative, and people who are okay with it tend to be more liberal. Um, conservatives don't like burning or desecrating the flag, except you'll see a lot of them with those back the blue stickers uh, on their cars and things like that. Uh, it is also against flag code to change the colors of the American flag. And the back the blue sticker changes the flag to a black and white flag with a single blue line. Uh, that is against flag code as well, but yet they don't have a big problem with that. Uh, 
It's also against flag code to make the flag into clothing, to wear it. Uh, so, yeah, people are very selective about which regulations they like and which regulations they don't. Um, <clears throat> and then protest and public spaces, Snyder versus Phelps. Uh, many of you may be familiar with Westboro Baptist. They are an extremely uh, right-wing uh, religious organization who will show up and protest uh, funerals of celebrities, funerals of soldiers that were killed uh, in action, police officers, things like that. Uh, they protest in public spaces with signs that say, uh, God hates gay people, except they use a, a negative term for gay people. Uh, God is punishing the country for allowing gay marriage, you know, this kind of stuff. And they show up at soldiers' funerals because they know that they'll get attention. And it's most people believe what they do is disgusting regardless of which side of the political spectrum they tend to be on because it's just disrespectful to do this at a funeral. But it is protected. Um, the court ruled that they cannot be sued provided they stay on public property. So if they are on the sidewalk outside the church where the funeral is taking place, their right to protest as they are protesting is protected by the Constitution. So this just kind of goes to show us that even though we don't like something, that something goes against our own personal beliefs of what is acceptable, it is still protected by the Constitution, whether you like it or not. Uh, speech plus is when we combine all of these things. So let's say you're at a protest and at a protest, you may see visual signs. You may see, uh, you may hear speech that you don't like. You may see the burning of an American flag. You may see all kinds of things. Uh, but when it's all practiced together, it's protected. Uh, the only restriction being is, is to maintain public order and safety. So, uh, if you're participating in a protest, usually there's a path that you have to follow, and that's just so that you know traffic can be shut down, people aren't going to get hit by cars, all that kind of stuff. But we, we're having a lot of debates about protest and what some people think is acceptable and what other people think is not acceptable. We've seen, you know, for the past few months, a major protest movement against the killing of. Uh, African Americans and people of color by the police, the Black Lives Matter movement, and you'll get everything from people cheering on what they're doing to people saying that they're pathetic, they obviously don't have jobs because they're out in the streets protesting, yada, yada, yada. So, But whether you like a protest or not, it is protected by the Constitution. Our right to protest is protected and is probably one of our most important freedoms under the First Amendment. Freedom of the press. <clears throat> Freedom of the press. Uh, the press is free to publish material, um, you know, that informs us of our government's corruption, of it not upholding its responsibilities to the citizens, and is probably one of our best tools in holding government accountable. Now, we've entered this weird phase in our history where we have started to demonize the media and the press uh, if we don't agree with what they're saying. Uh, President Trump has been really good at this as far as, you know, declaring things fake news that make him look bad and things that he don't he doesn't agree with. Um, you know, we have to be careful because the media, the, the, the news is there to hold these individuals accountable and keep us informed. Now we know the media has its problems as well. And we have a whole chapter on that that we'll talk about. Um, <clears throat> but when it comes to the freedom of the press, uh, there is this rule called prior restraint that the government cannot block the publication of material just because it deems it harmful to the government, except in an extraordinary circumstances. An exception here. <coughs> Excuse me. An exception here is um, let's say that we have troops. Well, we do have troops, you know, in the Middle East, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And let's say that those troops are going to be moving from one place to another to say, get ready for a big operation that's about to go down. Um, 
and let's say that, like, say the New York Times finds out about this, the government can restrict the publication of that information because it could endanger the lives of those soldiers. So if we have soldiers that are, say, moving from one part of Iraq to another, if we allow the media to publish that information, then it could tell, you know, insurgents in Iraq where those soldiers are going to be at exactly what time, and they could attack them or set up roadside bombs and things like that. So we don't want that kind of information being leaked to the wrong people. So government can restrict that. What it cannot restrict is things that expose corruption. So uh, many of you may have heard of the Pentagon Papers, but this comes out of a case in 1971, New York Times versus the United States. Um, <clears throat> through a leak, um, the New York Times gets a hold of a lot of documents that essentially show the American people that the government has been lying to us about the Vietnam War, about why we're there, how many people have died, all that kind of stuff. The New York Times gets a hold of all of these documents through a leak and decides to publish them. Well, the government takes them to court saying that, you know, this is classified information, this should have not never been in the hands of the New York Times, and that they cannot publish this information. Well, the court ruled in favor of the New York Times, saying that there was no compelling interest to protect government corruption and that the American people needed to be made aware that their government was lying to them. So this goes into publication, and this is really when uh, the citizens' trust in government really starts to decline because we find out about a lot of things our government had been hiding from us. Um, <clears throat> now, journalists risk a lot in doing this kind of stuff. There is no federal law that protects journalists from having to reveal their sources, but 30 states have state laws called shield laws that protect them. That way they can keep sources anonymous or they don't have to tell the government who leaked information. We've seen a lot of this in the Trump administration where people have been leaking information to the press and Trump has been trying to crack down on leaks from his administration. But a lot of times without these leaks, we wouldn't find out about the things that our government is doing wrong. And so we have to protect that freedom of the press so that government can be held accountable by the public. Now, two types of journalism that are not permitted are libel and slander. <clears throat> libel is when you publish something, uh, what, what the law says is a reckless regard to the truth. Essentially, it's a lie, and you know it's a lie, but you publish it anyway. Uh, slander is when something is said, maybe on the news or something like that, and you know it's a lie, but you say it anyway. We see this a lot with celebrities, celebrities that sue gossip magazines and sites like TMZ and stuff like that. These things are not protected because they are not true. And so uh, reporting them as if they are true could damage a person's ability to make a living, uh, you know, to be part of society, you know, things like that. Especially today, we have a lot of cancel culture where we will shut people down for the, the, anything that we hear about them negative. And so uh, the, there's a responsibility of the press, now just the press, not individuals, but the press from publishing this information. And then obscenity and pornography. These two are not protected. Uh, there was a there was a uh, Supreme Court case over the issue of pornography, and Justice I believe it was Justice Stewart uh, says that the the rule they came up with is very vague, and so he says pornography is an obscenity is not protected. I don't know how to define it, but I know it when I see it. Well, that's a very vague sentiment because what some people consider obscenity and pornography, other people consider art. And so this is where this, this rule has been hard to enforce. So something is not protective, protected if deemed prurient to the average person, depicts sexual conduct in an offensive way, and lacks artistic or scientific value. Well, that's very subjective. We can go on the internet right now <laughs> and find all kinds of examples about this being subjective. Um, so pornography is one of those hard ones to nail down. It's come up 
a, a bit when it comes to say government funding of the arts. Uh, government does give grants to arts, uh, art groups and things like that, which then give money to artists to create their works. And sometimes people have problems with nudity or depiction of sexual acts, even if it's being done in an artistic way. So this one is very, there's a huge gray area here when it comes to this type of issue. Now, the big one, <laughs> or at least the one that people like to debate the most, uh, a lot of people will tell you the Second Amendment is the most important uh, amendment in the Constitution. I still think the first is more important, but we have a lot of debate today over, um, you know, gun ownership, gun restriction, things like that. And the, the Second Amendment itself makes it very difficult uh, to decide what is allowed and what what is not allowed when it comes to... Uh, you know, you know, restricting uh, gun ownership. So we'll read the Second Amendment just to start us off. The Second Amendment says, A well-regulated militia, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. So, depending on where you stand on this issue... Uh, people tend to focus on one part or the other. So people who are very pro-gun, pro-Second Amendment, focus on the part that says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That, many people argue, means that gun ownership of any kind should not be restricted. Now, people who are in favor of gun control and restriction, tend to focus on a well-regulated militia, saying that the word regulated shows that the Founding Fathers meant for gun ownership to be, have some type of regulation and control. So, we have very little direction from the Supreme Court on this issue. Um, but there's still disagreement over, you know, what types of guns people should be able to own, um, you know, going through background checks and things like that. Um, so a couple, th these are probably the two most uh, relevant cases to the Second Amendment, and they're both very recent. Uh, District of Columbia versus Heller, 2008. D.C. banned handguns within its city limits. If you know much about D.C., you know that Historically, it's had a very high crime rate. And so as a way of trying to lower crime in D.C., Washington, D.C., they banned handguns. And the Supreme Court struck down this rule stating that citizens have a right to, sorry, that should say own guns, not one gun, uh, that citizens have a right to own guns to defend themselves and their property with reasonable restrictions. Um, sorry. So they leave the door open to gun control because they say reasonable restrictions, but make it very clear that no one can take the right to own a gun away from you because you have that right given to you by the constitution to protect yourself and to protect your family. Uh, McDonald versus Chicago. Again, another city that has a, a higher than average crime rate. Uh, and, and the same thing in Chicago. Uh, Chicago passed a lot of restrictions to make it very difficult to get a handgun. A lot of hoops you had to jump through, background checks, waiting periods, all that kind of stuff to get a gun. And so uh, the Supreme Court says that if <clears throat> that the Second Amendment applies to all states and you cannot make it unnecessarily difficult to obtain a firearm in your state. So again, the, the court seems to side, uh, you know, with the idea that all Americans have the right to own a gun. They don't weigh into the area of what types of guns that, that refers to. That is <clears throat> where they're kind of leaving the door open for Congress to, to deal with those issues. Now, Guns are a part of American culture. You look at this map here, and this shows you percent of citizens who own guns per state. 
Now, one of the most surprising things to me about this map was that Texas was only 35%. Uh, but in a state like Texas, you actually have more guns than citizens in private ownership. The thing is, you just have a lot of people who own multiple guns. But I would have thought our number would have been around like 50%. So it was kind of surprising that it was as low as it is. Uh, if you look in the more uh, rural states like Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, North Dakota, where there's lots of uh, farms and ranches, it's, it's obvious why those states have high gun ownership. You know, if you call the police, it's going to take them a long time to get to you. If there's even a police department, many people depend on sheriffs and, and things like that. Um, you can see in a lot of the liberal states that gun ownership is much lower than it is in the South and the conservative states. Um, but yeah, the, the court is pretty clear here that, you know, the government of cities, states, the federal government cannot outlaw the ownership of guns. Now where we're stuck at is debating what types of guns that means and what type of restrictions we can put on them. Now, the majority of the rest of the amendments deal with the rights of people who are accused of a crime. So we know that this is very, this was very, very important to the founding fathers. Uh, and we call all of those things together due process. So the fourth, fifth, sixth, and eighth amendments protect citizens against arbitrary action by the national or state government. Courts have two difficult conflicting goals that they have to uphold. One, they have to protect society from dangerous people. But even if you're accused of a crime, they have to protect an individual's constitutional rights. So those are, those are goals that are in conflict with each other, but we are all entitled to these rights by the Constitution. A uh, couple of rules. Exclusionary rule. The court will not include evidence in a, in a trial that is obtained in violation of the Fourth Amendment, which means that for, in most cases for uh, police officers to search your home and your property and things like that, they have to have a search warrant. If evidence is obtained illegally without a search warrant, it has to be thrown out and cannot be used against you in a trial. Probable cause. <clears throat> this is a difficult one. Um Probable cause is the legal grounds law enforcement uses to make an arrest or conduct a search. What we're seeing right now going on in our country, probable cause is probably the most controversial part of contact with law enforcement because we are leaving it up to completely up to one person or a couple of people to determine what that probable cause is. So this is where most problems in policing start is with probable cause. So let's use a couple of examples here. Um, the one that upsets me the most <clears throat> is the case of Philando Castile. Philando Castile, uh, this was in Minnesota, the same police department that killed George Floyd, I believe. Uh, Philando Castile was a Law-abiding citizen, no criminal record. He was a black man. He worked at the school district. People loved him. Uh, he was driving down the road in his car one day with his girlfriend and child in the back seat. And a police officer pulls him over. And so for a police officer to pull you over, they have to have probable cause. A uh, police officer pulls over Mr. Castile. And Mr. Castile says, you know, why am I being pulled over? What did I do? And he says, well, you match the description of someone who robbed this place a couple of nights ago. And at the time the police officer sees Mr. Castile, he's probably 100 yards away from him, you know, the length of a football field. It's sitting in his police car, but yet he can see Mr. Castile clear enough to say that he looks just like a suspect of a robbery, I find that hard to believe. But that is his probable cause for pulling over Mr. Castile. Mr. Castile is a law-abiding citizen. He tells the police officer, okay, I understand. I just want to let you know I do have a concealed handgun license and I have a gun in the car. So the police officer tells Mr. Castile to get his license and registration and when he reaches for it, the police officer pulls out his gun and opens fire. 
and says that he thought Mr. Castile was going for his gun, even though he had just told him everything he needed to know. Mr. Castile did nothing wrong. His wife uh, turns on her phone and starts live broadcasting this via Facebook that he's been shot. You know, she's screaming, the, the, the daughter is screaming in the back seat, and he did nothing wrong. But probable cause was left up to one person, that police officer. And so in a lot of these cases, uh, police officers, a lot of these cases that we see on TV, the probable cause is questionable. Uh, either the police officer won't tell the person why they're being stopped, what the probable cause is, or the probable cause is resisting arrest. And then the question becomes, can you resist arrest if you're not under arrest? Because most of these people are not placed under arrest when they are accused of resisting. So probable cause creates most of the problems we have today in policing. Uh, search and seizure. Law enforcement agents search an accused person's property and collect any evidence to an alleged crime. Now, if a police officer is going to come into your home or onto your property, they must have a search warrant. The exception to this is your vehicle. Your vehicle is mobile, and therefore uh, law enforcement, it kind of falls in this exception area because it would take too long to hold you on the side of the road there to wait for a search warrant, but they still have to have probable cause. So if a police officer sees you swerving, driving down the road, and they pull you over, and when they look through the, your backseat window, they see a uh, half-empty bottle of bourbon, that's probable cause because they believe that you're driving while intoxicated. Um, now, if a police officer pulls you over and wants to search your vehicle because they think you may have drugs in your vehicle, they have to have some reason to believe that. The one that they typically use is that the car smells like marijuana. Um, <clears throat> or they have to have seen you maybe throw something out the window or something like that. But again, the probable cause can be questionable uh, because it's solely up to this one person's discretion to say, this is why I pulled you over and this is why I'm going to search your vehicle. Now, a couple of exceptions here. In your vehicle, the police officers cannot force you to open anything that is locked. So if your glove compartment is locked, your trunk, you have any containers in the car, some cars have storage under the seats that lock and things like that, they cannot force you to open it and have to obtain a search warrant. But again, we leave a lot of this up to the discretion of police officers and police officers, you know, are trying to get arrests. They're trying to write tickets. They'll tell you they don't have quotas. They do have quotas. So this is what you know, our due process is supposed to protect us from, but we see that our system is not perfect. Arrest. <clears throat> Police may arrest you without a warrant, but they still have to have probable cause. Uh, but if your arrest is the result of, say, a long-term investigation, then they're typically going to have to have a warrant. But when they pull you over on the side of the road, they can arrest you without a warrant, because they should have witnessed something that is evidence that you're committing a crime. Now, this goes back to what we were talking about with resisting arrest. Another case that, <clears throat> that is very upsetting is the case of Sandra Bland. Sandra Bland, uh, African-American woman, she was at the Texas A&M University in Commerce. She was there for a job interview, um, and she had gotten the job. And as she was driving off of campus, I'm trying to remember, she either ran a stop sign or rolled through a stop sign and was pulled over by a police officer. The police officer comes up to her vehicle and uh, she is smoking a cigarette when he comes up to her vehicle. And the police officer says, ma'am, I need you to put out your cigarette. And she says, no, I'm not putting out my cigarette. I'm in my car. I don't have to do that. It's not illegal to smoke in my car. So he goes on and on, ma'am, put out the cigarette, ma'am, put out the cigarette, and keeps getting more irate, and she's getting irate, and she's like, no, I'm not putting out my cigarette, you don't have the authority to tell me to do that, and so he opens her door and starts dragging her out of her car, and tells her that she is resisting arrest, but at no time did he tell her she was under arrest, nor did she commit a crime that rose to the level of being arrested. 
the only thing she had done was run a stop sign, which is a ticketable offense. So this is a problem, telling someone they are resisting arrest when they are not even under arrest. It, it, it just can't happen that way. And so this is why a lot of people want police officers held more accountable because of these types of things. And then, of course, Miss Bland is arrested. She's taken to prison and then she or um, she's taken to jail, the local jail there, and then dies in that jail. And it's she dies under very questionable circumstances. And so this is a problem, again, with this with most of these stops that happen on the side of the road. Now, I don't want you to think that Professor Phillips hates police officers. I don't hate police officers. They have a very difficult job to do. But because they have chosen to do the job that they do, they should be held to a higher level of scrutiny. Nobody forced them to take the job of being a police officer. But if they take that job, they are accountable and need to have a high level of responsibility. Um, and so, you know, Probable cause, arrests, these types of things can cause a lot of problems because we leave them up to the discretion of a single person or a, a couple of people. Now, after you are arrested, you will go into detention. This is where they take you down to the police station or the county jail or whatever, and you will be held there until you get a hearing in front of a judge. And historically, this has been a period of abuse and illegal interrogation tactics. When you are arrested, the first thing you should do, if you're ever arrested, I hope none of you ever are, the best way to beat the criminal justice system is to never come in contact with the criminal justice system. But if you are arrested, the first thing you should do is ask for an attorney. Um, an attorney is going to prevent you from saying anything that could, uh, incriminate yourself. Uh, during this period of detention, if you ask for an attorney, police officers have to stop questioning you, but we have historical examples where they will use abuse or psychological tactics to try and get you to talk, to get information out of you that can be used against you. This is why you should ask for an attorney, even if you can't afford one, because the Sixth Amendment guarantees you the right to representation in all criminal cases except traffic violations, because they're minor. Now, um, once your attorney is there, they will make sure that you don't say anything you shouldn't say, because the police are trying to get a confession out of you. That's what they're trying to do. And so you may say something that you think means nothing, but they can construe it in a way that seems like you may be saying that you're guilty. So that's, that's why it's important to have an attorney there. If they continue to ask questions, you can plead the fifth. The fifth amendment prevents you from testifying against yourself and incriminating yourself in a crime. Um, now a caveat about the sixth amendment, the sixth amendment guarantees you representation. What it does not guarantee you is good representation. Not all court-appointed attorneys are going to be the best attorneys. Unfortunately, in our criminal justice system, the best outcomes are for people with money because they can hire the best attorneys, the best legal defense teams, and typically get the best outcomes. Those of us who are middle class and poor, we struggle. And so our criminal justice system is not exactly fair uh, and definitely need some reform. The Fifth Amendment we talked about, um, you know, it protects you from self-incrimination. Uh, this is why the Miranda rights exist. Um, Miranda rights, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Uh, if you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed to you. This has to be read to you, every person at the time of their arrest. The reason being is because it is informing you that anything you say uh, can incriminate you and, and be used against you in court. And so the Miranda case comes from uh, this case in, I believe it was Arizona back in the 60s. Um, Miranda, the gentleman Miranda, was convicted of the rape uh, and kidnapping of an 18-year-old woman, but... He confessed to the crime during his interrogation, but he had not been informed that he did not have to say anything. 
And so an attorney actually gets his case thrown out because he was not informed of his constitutional rights, even though he was guilty of the crime and admitted to it. Um, so now the Miranda rights have to be read to every person at the time of their arrest. If they are not, a case can be thrown out of court. Uh, the Fifth Amendment also protects you with double jeopardy, meaning that you cannot be tried for the same crime twice. So um, let's say you're found not guilty of murder. As soon as you're found not guilty, you can admit to the crime, and they cannot try you again. That's what double jeopardy does. It gives the state their opportunity to make their case. If a jury finds you innocent, that is the decision that stands. Uh and eminent domain is covered in the Fifth Amendment. Uh, government cannot take your property without compensation. Uh, you see this a lot when cities and states are building highways and roads and stuff like that. The government cannot just come in and seize your property. They have to give you fair compensation for your property. Eighth Amendment. <clears throat> now this one uh, we've debated as a country uh, as recently as the 1970s. Um, the Eighth Amendment protects citizens from cruel and unusual punishment. Um, in the 70s, we started having a debate about whether the death penalty uh, was considered cruel and unusual. Um, <clears throat> in 1972, the Supreme Court suspends the death penalty because they believe it is being applied unevenly and more often to African Americans than any other group. So the death penalty stays suspended for about 8 to 10 years. Uh, states are required to revise their death penalty laws, um, and eventually the Supreme Court will reinstate the death penalty, but says that states essentially have the right to decide if they are going to use it or not. But they must allow for appeals and access to the court system, uh, and reform this process. Now today, um, African Americans are still executed at a rate of about two to three times more than white citizens, which is crazy because African Americans only make up 12% of the United States population and white citizens make up 70% of the United States population. So it is being still unevenly applied to African Americans in our country. Now, the court does not outlaw the death penalty, but it does outlaw some methods of the death penalty. Today, we use lethal injection. Um, <clears throat> in some states in the West, you can still request a firing squad if you want, but we do not use hanging, electrocution, uh, um, I don't think we use the gas chamber anymore. Uh, yeah, so most states that do practice the death penalty use lethal injection with a few that will let you decide if you want a firing squad. This map over here on the right, all the states in black are the ones that use the death penalty. All the ones in green do not use the death penalty. Um, <clears throat> Texas has the highest rate. Um, in 2016, 1,439 people were executed with Texas being responsible for 538. In Texas, we have nicknamed our uh, death row the express lane. Uh, we Most Texans are heavily in favor of the death penalty, and we don't waste a lot of time executing uh, people who have been found guilty. Um, <clears throat> the death penalty has never been proven to deter crime, which is the argument that is used for the death penalty, that if people know... Um, that the death penalty is possible, they won't commit crimes. This has never been proven to be true. Uh, the United States is the only Western Hemisphere country that uh, still uses, or, or Western in the sense of um, democracy and things like that. Western country is kind of the terminology we use, uh, that still uses it. Most European countries do not use it. Uh, Canada, uh, many of Latin American countries don't use it anymore. Uh, the Eighth Amendment has also been used to argue for reform in prison conditions, saying that uh, things like overcrowding, inadequate food, medical care, sanitation, that <clears throat> all of these can fall under cruel and unusual punishment, um, especially in private prisons. We have a problem in the United States with 
prisons now being run by corporations, and those corporations do not uh, provide the best uh, living conditions in prison. And this is a tough thing for most people because people don't have a lot of sympathy for prisoners. Um, you know, a lot of people feel like, oh, if you committed a crime and you've been sent to prison, then you are entitled to every type of punishment that you're getting. Well, you know, there are people in prison simply for stealing something that might be worth a hundred bucks or something. And in that case, do they deserve to die in prison because they can't get medical care? No. Nobody does. It's actually a violation of the Constitution and human rights. And in some of these private prisons that are being run for profit, they are being run to turn as big a profit as possible. And the way they do that is by cutting services to the prisoners. So you'll have we've had a lot of prison uh, strikes and, and protests because of this, where you know in some jail cells people had uh, backed up sewage up to their cabs. Uh, because the prison refused to fix anything or people who are dying from simple infections because they're being denied medical care. Regardless of whether somebody is in prison, they are still entitled to the protections of the Constitution. Right to privacy is a difficult one. Do we have a right to privacy huh. as a citizen? Well, the Constitution doesn't say anything about privacy. <coughs> Excuse me. But... We've used some decisions by the Supreme Court to try and kind of patch together a right to privacy. And most of the issues having to do with privacy uh, have to do with uh, sexual issues, uh, with the exception of the right to die. Now, the first one, birth control. Uh, back in 1965, you know, birth control had come onto the market uh, and a lot of women felt that this was like a seminal moment because it allowed women to be in charge of their reproductive health. It allowed them to make the decision to not have children until they wanted to. But a lot of states made it illegal to provide birth control to women. And one such state was Connecticut. And so in this case, Griswold versus Connecticut, uh, Miss Griswold is the executive director of Planned Parenthood. And she decides that she is going to continue supplying birth control, especially to married couples, even though it was illegal under Connecticut law. She does this on purpose because she wants to be arrested and she wants this to go to the Supreme Court. And so the case does make it up to the Supreme Court and they strike down these laws saying that the third, fourth, and fifth amendments, uh, when combined, imply a reasonable expectation of privacy uh, in citizens' lives, especially when making decisions about, uh, you know, reproduction and sexual health and things like that. So the court, this is where the court kind of establishes this idea that there is an expectation of some privacy uh, that can be found in uh, the Bill of Rights. Now, the next big one, and the one that we are still fighting about today uh, abortion. In 1973, I think I said the wrong date for that earlier. It's 1973. Roe versus Wade uh, stated that a woman has the right to seek an abortion as long as it is prior to the 27th week of pregnancy. So today, abortion is permissible in the first two trimesters. After the second trimester, it is no longer permissible unless there is a threat to the health of the mother. Uh, but there has to be a doctor's diagnosis and authorization. Um, Roe has probably been challenged more than any other Supreme Court ruling, um, and it's still being debated today. We have, um, we have uh, states that are passing heartbeat laws saying that abortion uh, should be illegal once you can detect a fetus's heartbeat. Well, a fetus's heartbeat can be detected uh, at about six weeks. And so, um, this is earlier than most women even know that they're pregnant. And so, uh, it would drastically shift that window from the end of the second trimester to the very beginning of the first trimester, which is not what Roe versus Wade says. Uh, but we're still waiting. One of these cases is going to make it to the Supreme Court. So it'll be, we'll, we'll be waiting to see how this court 
will interpret that law. There's always the possibility that a later Supreme Court could overturn this decision with a different decision. Um, it would probably lead to chaos and some, uh, you know, protest and, you know, it's not going to stop abortion. Women were having abortions well before 1973. The problem is, is that they were having them in unsafe conditions and were dying from them. So, uh, but with Roe versus Wade, uh, abortion falls in this category where women have the right to make this decision for themselves and it is covered under this idea of privacy with reasonable restriction. Now, right to die. Should you have the right to end your own life? <clears throat> um, most of you are too young to remember Dr. Kevorkian. In the 1990s, there was a doctor named Dr. Kevorkian who would assist uh, people with uh, ending their own lives, uh, typically only if they were terminal, terminally ill. So if you were suffering with cancer or AIDS or some other condition where you knew you were going to die, uh, Dr. Kevorkian would assist you uh, in, in committing suicide just through uh, simple injections into your IV and things like that. And of course, he was arrested numerous times and eventually sent to prison and things like that for doing this. Um, the Supreme Court has not really, uh, did not really take a stance on this issue, did not uh, provide definitive clarification until 2006. Uh, in Oregon, Oregon passed a state law allowing doctors in Oregon to use drugs to facilitate the death of terminally ill patients. Um, the Supreme, this case made it all the way to the Supreme Court, and the court essentially upheld the law in Oregon. They didn't really issue a lot of, of guidance on it, but upheld the idea that the states could make this decision for themselves. And now we have, I think there's three or four states in the United States where you can do this now, legally. And then sexual orientation, which goes back to sex and reproductive health. Um, <clears throat> homosexuality has been debated in our country for a very long time. There have been rules to restrict homosexuality in our country. Uh, we'll talk about the, the LGBT struggle for, for civil rights in the next chapter. But looking at some of the cases that led to where we are today. Um, Hardwick versus Georgia. In 1986, Supreme Court overturned a lower court ruling on state anti-sodomy laws. Um, anti-sodomy laws essentially were laws that were on the books that said that, uh, you know, even consenting adults could not engage in homosexual relationships. Uh, in this case, um, Mr. Hardwick, uh, was a gentleman who had a warrant for his arrest. The police officer comes to his home, his roommate lets the police officer in, uh, to serve the warrant, which, uh, which was for public drunkenness. The officer walks into Mr. Hardwick's bedroom where he is engaged in sex, uh, and the police officer arrests him not only for the warrant, but also charges him under anti-sodomy laws as well. Uh, the Supreme Court rules in this case that the Constitution gives no direct protections to sexual activity. So it in this case, the Supreme Court upholds these anti-sodomy laws in the states. Now, <clears throat> the case that will overturn that is Lawrence versus Texas. Uh, case in 2003, where uh, this was in Houston, I believe. I think it was out of Houston. Um, Mr. Lawrence and his, his boyfriend live in an apartment complex, and the, in the apartment next to them uh, is a gentleman who very much dislikes them because they are gay. And so one evening he decides to call the police and say that it sounds like someone is being killed in the apartment next door to him. So there is an exception to probable cause and having a warrant if you believe a crime is being committed at that moment. Police can enter the home to prevent the crime from being committed. So the police show up, they enter the home, and they find Mr. Lawrence and, and his boyfriend having sex. 
And so they are arrested under anti-sodomy laws, taken to jail. Uh, I believe one of them loses their job because of the arrest and things like that. And they essentially uh, are in the same situation as the Hardwick case. But this time they fight their case all the way to the Supreme Court. And the court rules that citizens are entitled to respect of their private lives. And this overturns the anti-sodomy laws and establishes that... um, People are are entitled to the right to privacy over who they choose to have sex with. Uh, And then, of course, in 2015, Obergfell versus Hodges, two gay couples, the Obergfell couple and one other couple, and I can't remember their name, uh, fight their cases all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, Obergfell also comes out of Texas. The couple applied for a marriage license, were denied a marriage license, and so they file a case that makes its way all the way to the Supreme Court and they make an argument based on the equal protection clause in the 14th amendment that all rights are entitled to all citizens and that they can't be denied a marriage license simply because they're gay. And a lot of those provisions from the loving case and many of the other cases are applied here. And of course the the court does legalize uh, gay marriage in 2015. And just another quote to end the chapter on.